tonight. I sure do love you folks, and it's a joy to be able to sing together and open up God's Word. I, I pray that the uh, the evening that we share together is a refreshing one, um, and that it's challenging and uplifting all at the same time. Now, we're in 2 Timothy this evening, as you may suspect. 2 Timothy chapter 2, started this chapter last week, and we'll just be looking at one verse again tonight. It is a verse that is absolutely jam-packed with uh, with uh, doctrinal truth and with practical truth for us. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I'll be reading verse 2 here in just a minute. A while back, uh, I shared a story with you about a state invitational uh, collegiate track meet where a team of four men ran in the mile relay. The first man ran a very, very fast leg, representing his team, his college, and the second man did well uh, also, but soon after the baton was passed to the third man, who was their best runner, <clears throat> that, that runner stopped, walked off the track, and sat down in the middle of the field. And at first, the other team members thought that he had pulled a muscle or that he'd sprained an ankle or something like that, and so the team ran across the field. And they asked him, what happened? What's going on? And his reply was, I don't know, I just didn't feel like running anymore. Now, understandably, his teammates, his coach, and everybody else from the college that he represented were quite upset by that act. Um, the exasperated questions on every single mind was, don't you know that you're not just out there representing yourself, but your team and your school? Have you forgotten all the time that the coach has invested in you and the time that your teammates have invested to get where they're at as well? How could you selfishly destroy all of that? Well, friends, on an infinitely more important level, countless people in the Lord's churches do the same thing. They simply make no effort or they unexplainably drop out of the race, often with no better reason than the apathy of that college runner. Now, in our study through the book of 2 Timothy, we should understand that Timothy wasn't at the point of dropping out of the race. But we've seen several things about him. Because of his timid personality, he was a man who hated conflict and hated criticism, which are, by the way, an inescapable part of leadership. If you're in any type of leadership role at all for any length of time, you're going to experience conflict on some level with some people. You're going to experience criticism as well. The hardship of standing for the truth in the face of many people who were defecting from the faith was tempting Timothy not to use his spiritual gifts to uphold and to hand off the truth. Paul, who was awaiting execution in a prison cell in Rome as he personally crossed the line, finished his leg of the race, and prepared to hand the baton off, was deeply burdened about the need to hand off that baton to faithful men who would continue to run. Our text today is one that you should know very well. It has been a primary theme in the development of True North Baptist Church over the past four years. In this text, in this statement that's made, Paul is not only telling Timothy to take the baton and to carry it faithfully himself, but also to focus intently on handing it off to others who will carry it faithfully and in turn finish their leg of the race faithfully and turn and hand it off to others after them as well. And it's because of such faithful men down through history that we are here today. And it's through that effort that the Lord's churches will continue to thrive until he returns. That is the method. Any church, any individual church can fail in their leg of the race. And many do. Many have. And the impact on those that could have come after them is unthinkable if you stop to consider it. But also, on the other hand, any church can excel, can hit the acceleration zone in the relay, and they can go out with a blaze of speed for the Lord that will inspire many generations to come. And so we look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I hope that you 
I hope that you catch that spirit here and that, uh, that picture that's being developed for us in these verses. We're going to start in verse 1 just so we can get the context and the continuity of thought. 2 Timothy 2.1 Paul says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. The same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Well, as we saw last time in our study in 2 Timothy, the main theme in verses 1 through 7 of this chapter is being a fruitful Christian. That is the theme that's developed in a broader uh, in a broader sense here, verses 1 through 7. Every true Christian, I believe, every person who is really a believer in Jesus Christ, wants to be fruitful in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the focus of their life. That is the mission of their life. To be fruitful, uh, there is a person that you must be, and that's what we studied in verse 1. You must be a man or a woman who is strong in grace. Strong in grace. We spent a whole study, a whole hour together unpacking some of the, uh, the jewels that are found in that statement. So there's a person that you must be. There's also a task that you must complete. This is the primary task of God's people. You entrust the truth to other faithful believers. We see that in verse 2 today. And then we're going to see in our next section of Scripture next week that there is also a price that you must be willing to pay if you're going to be a fruitful Christian. You must be willing to suffer hardship as a soldier of Jesus Christ, as an athlete or a runner for Christ, as a hardworking farmer seeking to bring forth the fruits that he desires. And we see that uh, unpacked for us in verses 3 through 7. Tonight, once again, our focus is verse 2, and there's a lot there for us to cover and consider. I really hope that you enjoy this study as much as I did. But the message of our text in verse 2 is this. To be a fruitful Christian, you must, I underscore the word must, entrust the truth to others who will entrust it to others also. Before we examine this verse... I want to point out that it is applicable on several levels. There's not a person in this audience today or that's listening online that is a believer that this doesn't apply to on some level. The context overall, we understand, is local church ministry. That's very obvious, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a while. The primary application is to pastors and other church leaders. That is the primary application. Our task as leaders and as teachers and as preachers is to hand off God's truth to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. But on a broader level yet, mature believers, every mature believer must see his or her responsibility to impart biblical truth to younger believers than them, especially within the context of a local church ministry, though it can be accomplished on some level even outside of a church membership as you mentor others. Uh, further, this, uh, this principle broadens. Godly husbands must hand off the truth of God to their wives. The husband is responsible to shepherd his family. But communication, even there, isn't just one way. Wives should also regularly share with their husbands the truth that God teaches them. Parents are responsible to entrust the truth to their children. All of us who know Jesus Christ as Savior are responsible to share the gospel truth with those who are lost so that they may be saved. And so there's not really any, any way that you can dice this where it doesn't apply in every single relationship as a Christian. The idea is that if God has entrusted any truth from his word to you, it's not to make you feel good and then keep it to yourself for personal enjoyment or for personal betterment. He gives it to you so that you will pass it on to others. Jesus made a, a, a remarkable statement in John chapter 7 where he talks about um, he that, uh, that uh, partakes of the, uh, of the Son of God or of Jesus Christ. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That is the natural characteristic when a person takes truth in, they're like a, a living spring that truth flows out of to others. They're not a stagnant pond. 
that doesn't ever put anything out for the benefit of others. I want you to, to keep in mind as we walk through this that verse 2 follows and is directly built on the truth of verse 1. To entrust God's truth to others, you must be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. Therefore, if you're not saved and you don't know the grace that's in Christ Jesus, if you haven't experienced the grace that's in Christ Jesus, you're not going to have any truth to entrust to anybody else. And so, with that as a foundation, verse 2, our text today gives us three requirements if we want to be fruitful for the Lord. Three requirements. These are simple. Maybe you've heard me share some of them before. <clears throat> but first of all, to be fruitful for Jesus Christ, you must be clear on sound doctrine. You must be clear on sound doctrine. Of course, we must impart to others more than mere content, more than just mere head knowledge. Uh, you, can, you can feed scripture to a parrot and have them say it back. That doesn't mean that it's changed their, uh, their being or that they're saved. A person can do the same thing. And so there's more than just head knowledge that has to be passed on. There is much more. Uh, Paul reminded the Thessalonians uh, in a very tender way of this. He told them that I haven't imparted to you the gospel of Jesus Christ only, but also my own soul, because you were so dear to me. That should capture the heart of a discipler. Uh, that should be uh, what our heart really looks like. And so our, our text assumes that the truth that we impart is clothed in a godly life of love and passion for the soul of others. I'm not going to really dwell on that any more than just to try to set that framework for you at the beginning. This isn't just head knowledge type of facts that we're passing on, but, but truths that are cloaked completely in a life of godliness and love and passion for the souls of other people. But that being said, the clear focus of 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2 is on the content of sound doctrine and the need to pass that on. Paul refers to what Timothy had heard Paul teach. And he tells Timothy that he is to commit or deposit these truths in other men who would be able to turn around and teach others also. Every one of the words in that statement that he makes is so critical and drives home another nuance of this. But there are two aspects to this. Our, our first point is that to be fruitful for Christ, you must be clear on sound doctrine. So two, two sub points or, or thoughts on that. To be clear on sound doctrine... You must be convinced of the existence and the importance of absolute truth in the spiritual realm. We can't dance around that at all. You must be convinced of the existence and importance of absolute truth in the spiritual realm. This verse implies what our culture denies today. That there is a definable body of spiritual truth that can be known and it can be handed off faithfully to others. We live in a culture that's permeated with the view that spiritual truth is just a matter of personal preference. Much like your favorite flavor of ice cream. You know, for me, it may be the old fundamentals of, of uh, chocolate and vanilla and strawberry. You know, that good Neapolitan ice cream because I'm old-fashioned. For you, it may be sour, gummy worms, sprinkle birthday cake flavor or something odd like that. Because you like something more modern, something more flashy and dazzling. So if something is true for you, that's nice. This is the, the, the culture's idea. If something's true for you, that's nice and that's good. But don't you dare be so arrogant as to imply that your truth is true for everybody. As it often happens, folks, the prevailing worldview seeps into many churches. One third of America's baby boomer generation identify themselves as born again Christians still today. But half of those say that religions other than Christianity are equally good and true, including those that teach things such as reincarnation and astrology. <laughs> Modern churches have largely abandoned doctrinal truth. 
Subsequent generations barely believe uh, in anything more than just a watered down version of a little bit of Bible truth that mixes with error without any concern at all. And so it's just a, a, a degenerating funnel uh, as it falls apart. The once somewhat conservative Southern Baptist Convention just stated this week that issues like abortion <clears throat> are secondary matters and shouldn't sway the members of their churches and who they vote for in this upcoming election. Just yesterday, I listened to the testimony of a Baptist pastor's wife whose main social gathering is a homosexual group that's led by a transgender man. They find their identity together in his nail salon, where they spend four or five hours a week decorating their foot-long fingernails. <laughs> Today, the central function of pastors has largely changed from that of being a truth broker to being a manager of a business that masquerades as a church. Now, the world may have a litany of different ideas throughout the ages, but to be a Christian has always meant to believe what the Bible teaches as absolute truth. That's right. This is why the New Testament writers not only framed spiritual truth in doctrinal terms, but they called for the preservation of that truth and the protection of that truth in that form as established rigid Bible doctrines or truths. Uh, there is no spiritual truth in the absence of sound doctrine. That's what it's called in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10 and in Titus chapter 1 and verse 9. It's called wholesome words and doctrine which is according to godliness in 1 Timothy 6.3. It's called the form of sound words in 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14. You have these types of statements that are made over and over throughout all three of these wonderful pastoral epistles as, uh, as an older man, Timothy, reaches back with the baton to these younger men, Titus and Timothy. Did I say Timothy earlier? Paul, this older man, Paul, reaches back to, to Timothy. I'm getting to be an older man, I'm just forgetful. It reaches back to Timothy and to Titus and he's, and he's telling them, look, there is a, a set form. It's like a, a, a uh, form that's built for a foundation to be poured into. And that, uh, that cement hardens into a defined shape. And it doesn't change ever. That's what doctrine is like that's laid out in the Bible. Uh, it is this doctrine, or more precisely, the, the truth that the doctrine expresses that was taught by the apostles and delivered to the Lord's churches. In the book of Jude, I love the statement that he makes. Jude was the, the half-brother of Jesus Christ. And, um, and I don't want to say this irreverently, but when I think of the statement that he made, he said, I wanted so badly to just write and talk to everybody about the common salvation that we have in Jesus. And of course, that's the byword of most modern churches today, right? Let's just all gather around this wonderful doctrine of salvation. He said, it was needful for me to set that aside and talk to you about earnestly contending for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And so there is this set body of truth that is, uh, that is absolute, that is eternal, that's established and fixed in the heavens according to what the scriptures teach. And we're given that truth. And you better understand and be very clear on that. Without, uh, without the truth that was delivered to the Lord's churches, we have no hope for salvation. Without it, according to 2 John verse 9, we have neither the Father nor the Son. Paul makes it very plain that we can only grow in Christ if we stay within this clear-cut doctrinal framework because its truth is what provides the means of our growth. God's people are commanded not to depart from the truth that they received in the beginning. It's not talking about in the beginning like Genesis, but in the beginning when they were first saved. And there was truth that was committed to them, so much like Paul was saying to Timothy here. That was what was commanded in, uh, in 1 John in about four or five different references. They're commanded 
People of God, they're commanded not to let anything slip of what they had heard. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1, uh, once again, Jude chapter 3 calls it the faith that was once delivered or entrusted or deposited in the saints. Paul admonishes Timothy over and over that it's only by adhering to this, this good doctrine that he will become a good minister of Jesus Christ. That's found in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6. Now, because of all this, the apostles instructed believers to guard this faith, to guard this doctrine to defend it, to stand firm in it, not to drift from it, to become established in it, and then to transmit it intact to succeeding generations. <laughs> I hope that you've noticed uh, tonight and in our past studies that there is a considerable emphasis on the themes of sound doctrine, teaching, and truth in the three short pastoral epistles. In fact, I've got all the references laid out in my notes here. There are 30, over 35 direct references that mention those very words in 1st and 2nd Timothy and in Titus. And so, as Paul handed the, the baton to Timothy and to Titus, he wanted them to hold unflinchingly to the truth because it was under direct attack. Back when we studied 1st John about a year ago or a year and a half ago, that was, that was a letter that was written about 25 years after Paul's death. There were false teachers who were promoting serious errors in this same church of Ephesus, where Timothy was located when Paul wrote this book of 2 Timothy. Just 25 years later, they were falling apart through, uh, through error or unsound doctrine. Today, as doctrine is being laid aside, Western Christianity has become simply one more expression of the self-movement. That includes many people who don't have the remotest interest in God, but people who call themselves Christians um, and yet seek to satisfy self first and foremost. You know, fire starter like Joel Osteen's book, Your Best Life Now, is sprinkled with references to God in the Bible throughout, but there couldn't be anything more unchristian than his message. The really frightening thing is that over 8 million people have bought copies of this one book alone. And a good portion of those people have probably walked away thinking that they've read some form of the Christian gospel. They think they understand the message of the Bible, and what they have read is really characterized by one word, me. My success, my self-esteem, my house, my car, my promotion, my life. That's the kind of trash that's passing for Christianity today. The need for true gospel preachers and teachers is more than severe in our day and age. Somebody needs to tell these people, uh, even if they're not inclined to hear, and even if it's over the heads of their own pastors, if you can call them that, that the gospel isn't about collaborating with God to make yourself successful in life. It's not about getting more stuff. And being more prosperous, it's about God forgiving hell-bound sinners of their sins only through the death of His Son. Bringing them to life from the spiritual dead and conforming them to the image of Jesus Christ. The gospel is about a specific body of truth that's been entrusted to the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ, who are then obligated to maintain that truth in its purity and live that truth and faithfully pass it on to others. Folks, it is the work of every single member of a scriptural church to do that. If a church isn't faithfully holding to that doctrine, practicing that doctrine, and passing that doctrine on faithfully through the means that's mentioned in our text, it is no longer functioning as a scriptural church, and those within the confines of its membership will wither and languish spiritually as that church atrophies and dies. And so, to obey Paul's commandment in our text, 
We must be convinced in a life-changing way of the existence and the importance of absolute truth in the spiritual realm, which is revealed to us only in the Bible. If you're convinced of it, if you're convinced of its existence and its importance, then you'll live for it and you'll die for it if necessary. Without that truth, we have nothing to hand off to anybody. Now, further, to be clear on sound doctrine, you must study the truth as delivered to us by the New Testament writers. You can't impart to others something that you're fuzzy on. <laughs> Have you ever heard somebody try to teach something that they really just didn't fully comprehend? <laughs> You have to be clear about the truth to hand it off. And to be clear about the truth, you've got to engage in a lifetime of perpetual study and perpetual growth for the Lord. You know, we could envy Timothy's unique place in history. He heard Paul teach the scriptures on many occasions. I'm sure it was a whole lot better than any of us could do here in this church. As they ate together and as they traveled together, Timothy had the privilege of being able to ask Paul any question about any subject in the Bible. But even though Timothy had such great advantages, Paul still had to exhort him. Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God. That's going to follow here shortly in verse 15 of this same chapter. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The reality is this. It doesn't matter whether you were blessed to be trained by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Every single person still has to work hard at studying the word if he or she wants to grow and become anything productive for the Lord. What does Paul mean? When he tells Timothy, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. Well, the idea isn't that Timothy was taught by these witnesses, but rather that these witnesses could all stand there one by one in a courtroom if necessary and could affirm the truth that Paul taught. They had heard it. They had observed it. They would witnessed it. He taught the same things wherever he went. We're talking about this defined body of truth that's established in doctrine in the scriptures. There were witnesses of what Paul taught in Ephesus, where Timothy was at, in Philippi, in Corinth, in Rome, in Jerusalem, in Thessalonica, in Berea, in Lystra, and Derbe, where Timothy grew up at, and in all the other cities that Paul had ministered in, there were witnesses in all those locations who could confirm the message that Paul had proclaimed. It wasn't secret inner circle truths like the Gnostics claimed to know. It was publicly proclaimed. Nothing was hidden about it. Nothing was mysterious about it. It was black and white. These witnesses also could confirm that Timothy had indeed heard that doctrine. It had been entrusted to him. And they could confirm that Timothy's doctrine squared with Paul's doctrine. Paul's uniform testimony to the truth teaches us that we can't bow to the pressure around us to soften the truth in order to be popular. You know, everybody wants to be liked, including pastors and including teachers, including disciplers. Everybody wants to have friends. Everybody wants to, have, uh, wants to have camaraderie and be respected and looked up to. And today, there's added pressure to compromise on the hearts of many pastors because, hey, if people get offended by what they preach, it's really easy for them to just jog down the road to the next church and the congregation will dwindle. And since numbers represent success in so many people's minds today, many pastors become politicians. They dodge the hard aspects of truth so as not to offend anyone ever. But as we're going to see in chapter 4 of this book, Paul specifically exhorts Timothy not to fall into playing to the crowd. He is to preach the word, which requires reproving, rebuking, and exhorting. 
And when a church has been faithfully taught, by the way, they'll love the Word of God. They'll love the truth, including the reproving, rebuking, and exhorting. And they'll yield to it, and they'll grow thereby. While it's especially incumbent on pastors and elders and teachers in a church to be able to exhort in sound doctrine, this applies to every single believer, every member of a local body. You know, there are so many winds of false doctrine blowing in our day that if you don't give yourself to diligent study of God's Word for yourself, you will surely be blown off course. It's bound to happen to be fruitful as a Christian. The first requirement is to be clear on sound doctrine, which includes both understanding that truth and genuinely living in accordance with that truth. Jesus' commission to his church was the delivery of the gospel to lost souls, baptizing those who gladly received the word, and then teaching them to observe all things that Christ had taught and commanded. In a word, <laughs> discipleship. Number two, to be fruitful for Jesus Christ, you must commit the truth to fat men. I'm using that as, an, as a, an acrostic here. Faithful, available, teachable. I'm not talking about overweight men, although they need the truth too, but to men who are faithful, available, and teachable. By the way, I didn't come up with that, uh, that acronym myself. I actually got it years ago, almost 20 years ago now, from Pat Briney, who's the assistant pastor of Mission Boulevard Baptist Church in Fayetteville, Arkansas. He says in this command to commit the truth to faithful men. The word commit is the verb form of the word that we've already studied in chapter 1, verses 12 and 14. Remember we talked about the deposit that had been made in Timothy and how Timothy needed to be faithful to guard that deposit that had been entrusted to him. This is the verb form of that. It refers to entrusting your valuable treasure, your most valuable treasure, to a trusted friend to guard for you during your absence. Believers have entrusted their lives to Jesus Christ, being convinced that he is able to, to keep that which they have committed unto him against that day. There is a deposit, remember, that's been made with Jesus Christ. And in turn, Jesus Christ has entrusted the precious, the precious truth or treasure of the truth with us, which includes the gospel message and all the counsel of God that's contained in his word. And folks, we must guard it with our lives. Remember back in chapter 1 and verse 14 that we were commanded this, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. We can't compromise the truth, or we will fail to guard the deposit that God has entrusted to us. But if we only guard this deposit, if that's all we do, or if we fail, um, um, if we fail to do something further with it, every one of us is going to die someday. And the truth will go no further than us. And we can say that on a church level, and we can say that, that on an individual level. We aren't just to keep it and guard it. We are to hand it off or commit it, now we find, to men who are faithful, men who are available, men who are teachable. I'm saying men just uh, kind of in a gender-neutral way, okay? I don't even like to say that. I'm talking about men or women. I'm talking about all people. It is a personal command now. Please take it very personally. The same commit thou, an individual personal pronoun, you is who it's talking about. The same commit thou. It can't be pushed off on somebody else in the church. It is God's command directly to you. Sadly, many people are spiritually lazy. And despite knowing Jesus Christ for years, they're little better equipped to effectively accomplish this work than when they were first saved. It's a tragedy. In some cases, it's the fault of the church itself that they're in. Failing to have the leadership, failing to have the vision, or failing to have the structure to equip all of its members. In other cases, 
It's the failure of individuals who just refuse to grow or refuse to yield some area to the Lord and surrender. But folks, let me tell you something from personal experience. It is an amazing and a rare privilege to be an active player in this biblical strategy when it works right. It's an amazing thing to see as an entire church pulls together and does it. And it's amazing to plug your individual gifting that God's given to you into that work or into that church to accomplish the work. And so let me talk to you real quick about who the truth is supposed to be entrusted to. Entrust the truth to faithful men. The word faithful implies, obviously, that these men are believers, but also that they're loyal, they're reliable. Now, we obviously can't always judge accurately in advance who's going to prove to be faithful. Paul was terribly disappointed by Phygelus, by Hermogenes in verse 15 of, verse, of chapter 1. He was terribly disappointed, we're going to find out in chapter 4 and verse 10, by a man named Demas. Probably he was disappointed by many more. We'll know people by their fruits by and by. Might take a little time to expose what they really are, but listen, if you want to be fruitful, look for younger believers who give evidence of being faithful dedicated to the Lord, loyal to the Lord, reliable in their commitment, and commit the great truths of the faith to them, both in teaching it to them and in intensive personal modeling of the faith to them. Entrust the truth to faithful men. Also, entrust the truth to available men. This process of entrusting sound doctrine to others takes time, doesn't it? It takes a while. Spiritual growth takes intentional, consistent, dedicated effort over time. We should be very quick to capitalize on the inertia of new believers. It's like people get saved and there's a certain amount of passion and emotion and, and momentum that they have as they come into the Christian life. And their lives have just been rescued from the clutches of <laughs> Satan. And it's, it's very important that we capture that and that we get them immediately engaged in this process under the mentorship of mature believers. We should be looking for such ones. Unfortunately, in many cases, believers aren't instructed. And they may come to us with many other distractions in their lives. A lot of things that pull them away. Some people as sincere as they may be, just chronically keep themselves too busy and preoccupied with other things. In some cases, there's a lack of spiritual understanding as a result of spiritual immaturity. And they need to be challenged to reshape their lives as wise stewards and cut out many unimportant and temporal things. Right. By the way, there are many things that are not bad, but they'll always keep people from being their best for the Lord. In other cases, people may have wrong priorities, and they're simply not interested in growing in the things of God. They need to be directly challenged to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and surrender to Him as Lord. In fact, if they're not surrendered to Him as Lord, they likely need to be challenged with the true gospel because there's something missing in their lives. In other cases, uh, they are at an inescapably busy time in life. But listen, you can only work with those who will make the time to allow you to commit the truth to them. Once again, I'll say that those whose lives have really been changed by the powerful gospel of Jesus Christ will have a heart to do whatever is necessary and sacrifice whatever is necessary and give whatever time is necessary to make themselves available to the greatest spiritual growth possible. It's going to be evident. Entrust the truth to available men and then entrust the truth to teachable men. Paul says that these men must be able to teach others also and that would imply or suggest if they're going to teach others, that those others are going to be teachable. No one is able to teach well 
unless he himself is also teachable. If Timothy hadn't been willing to receive teaching from Paul, he wouldn't have been qualified to teach others also. A know-it-all or a stubborn, self-willed person who wants to argue incessantly won't be able to teach others because people are going to resist their arrogance. Being teachable means being sensitive. Willing to change your views, willing to change your ways when you become convinced from Scripture that you're in error in some way. It means reverently and humbly being willing to learn from other godly men, not claiming to have the quarter on the truth yourself. And of course, it means having a never satisfied hunger to know God, to understand His Word in deeper ways. None of us, no matter how long we know the Lord, ever arrive spiritually in this life. In fact, I'll tell you this, that the more that I grow my knowledge of God's truth, the more I realize how little I know. And I crave it all the more. And so, to be fruitful for Christ, you must be clear on sound doctrine. You must entrust the truth to those who are faithful, available, and teachable. And finally, to be fruitful for Christ, you must catch and aim for the vision of spiritual multiplication. The task of reaching the world's more than 7 billion souls for Christ probably seems impossible at face value to most people. And I, I say this reverently, but uh, God seemingly could have devised a more efficient method than he did. Angels could have gone to every people group on the earth with the clear message of the gospel much sooner and much more powerfully and much more perfectly than we bumbling humans could do it. Yet God's choice was to work through us. God's plan is that of spiritual multiplication, folks. It's impossible to miss, as we read our text today, that there are four generations that are listed in our text. There is Paul, there's Timothy, there's faithful men, and there's the others that they also teach. If you teach somebody, and that person bottles the truth up, and they don't pass it on, the process stalls out right there. You become, at that point, involved in addition, not multiplication. And the souls of the world will not be reached. Sadly, that's where most church ministries are at today. But if those that you teach will teach others, who in turn teach others, who will in turn teach others, God works through you or through really through the methods of his word to mobilize a force for Christ that will both perpetuate his work and will engage you in a fruitful ministry of multiplication that will bring joy to your life like nothing else that you'll ever know as a Christian. And by the way, it may seem kind of slow in the moment, because remember, passing on the truth takes some time. It's an investment of heart and time, but in a short time, it will produce substance, and it will produce the results that God's looking for. You've probably heard the example before. Um, just uh, those of you that, that don't like math, you got to listen to, okay? So, suppose that two boys had a very rich father, and he made the two boys an offer. They could choose to receive either $100,000 per day for 31 days, or they could receive one penny the first day, doubled each day for 31 days. And that would be, well, the first day you get a penny, and the second day you get two pennies, and then you get four pennies, and then you get eight pennies, and then you get 16 pennies on the fifth day. Not a very good paycheck, is it? How many people here would choose the $100,000 a day? Nobody wants to raise their hand. Not a trick question. At the end of 31 days, that person would have $3.1 million. That's a pretty good payday. But the person who chose the penny that's doubled every day would come out at $2.2 billion at the end of the month. All right? That's just kind of a, a silly analogy to try to tie in here. But when it comes to spiritual multiplication, the process doesn't happen quickly, and it doesn't happen without any failures. We've unfortunately seen failures right here in our church ministry in the last four years where people have washed out or haven't stood for the truth. But the point is this, to be fruitful 
Look for those that you can teach who won't just study for their own benefit or for what they can gain from it, but for those that they will be able to teach others also. All right. Now, to apply this very practical scripture to your life, bear with me for just a minute here. Ask yourself two questions tonight. First of all, who is my Paul? Or if you're a woman, who is my Pauline? <laughs> In other words, whom have you placed yourself under as a spiritual mentor? Friend, you can't sit around forever with your spiritual umbilical cord in your hand, hesitant to ever plug it in. You'll never grow, and nothing will ever take place. As you stagnate, or as you fail to grow, days will turn into months, and months will turn into years. I have personally observed elderly people who are spiritual babies because they've never grown. God's design through a church ministry is to have everyone plugged into this model that we're talking about here. Vigorously growing, vigorously prospering spiritually, and moving on to become a Paul yourself. Who is your Paul? Ask God. Ask your pastor or your leadership. And then plug in and humbly open your life up to teaching and to scrutiny so that you can grow and you can flourish. And you can move through this discipleship model to become a leader yourself. So first of all, ask, who's my Paul? Second, ask yourself this question. Who are my Timothys? For men and women in this church, those who are more mature in the faith should train those who are newer in the faith. There's no clear definition to exactly what that means. If you've been a believer for at least a year or two, you should be looking for someone younger in the faith that you can hand off God's truth to. If you're not doing that, get involved in the lives of other believers. Help them grow and grow yourself in the process. Our small group ministry, of course, is one venue through which we dynamically seek to engage everybody in our membership in this process. If you haven't been putting your whole heart into it, by the way, I encourage you to commit yourself to that as we go into this next quarter. Get busy. Make up for lost time. If you have been plugged into it, I pray that this challenge tonight rekindles your heart to apply yourself even more than ever before. One further word of caution here, folks. Don't opt for perfection or nothing in this process. Sometimes laziness may hold somebody back because of the availability that's required for it to work. Sometimes they're intimidated because, well, this is just different than what they've been used to, which is generally a sort of spiritual apathy. Sometimes pride may hold somebody back because they don't want to open up to someone else and get real about their life and their problems. Sometimes history and relationships hold somebody back. Some may idealize the Paul-Timothy relationship and think, we can never come close to that in any way whatsoever. Folks, in all those cases, here is the common ending. They do nothing at all. They don't grow at all, and they aren't fruitful at all. They get left in the dust, while others take flight and soar to great spiritual heights. They continue to stay down on the ground, looking up at others, maybe feeling a little resentful and out of place as they continue to make excuses. Forty years later, they're still doing the same thing if they're even around at all. Their children have turned out to be even less than they are. They're like that runner in my story at the beginning of the message tonight who just didn't really feel like running. They hinder themselves and they hinder the entire church team. Folks, listen to me. All of us have time constraints. All of us work different hours and different days. There is rarely a perfect schedule, but there is always a way that we can prioritize our time for that which we really want to do. That's right. Ask God to give you a Paul. Ask God to give you a Timothy or two to commit the truth to. Get together with the stated intent of doing what we've discussed tonight. Get into the Word. Pray for and pray with one another. 
share together in the things of God, live a godly life before one another, talk about the hard things, be accountable in temptation and in difficulties, model how to live in the home, how to trust Christ, how to lead people to Christ. He'll use you to bear fruit for eternity. And you'll play the role that he expects each one of us to play within one of his local churches to win those seven billion plus souls and commit his truth for them. That's our job. That's our mission. That is the entirety of our vision and our focus in ministry. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. You want to live a fruitful life? Let's redouble our efforts in this way. Father, thank you for the time that we can open your word this evening. I pray that, uh, that you will continue to drive these truths deeply into our hearts. And that we'll not just be faithful to keep the truth that's been committed to us, but to make sure that we're teaching those that are faithful and available and teachable so that they can turn around and teach it also. Thank you for the model of your word that you've given to us so we don't have to flounder in our own efforts, but so we can just simply build our ways after yours and you get all the honor and glory for it. I pray that you'll find True North Baptist Church uh, robustly doing this work without failure. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, anything at all to share this evening before we dismiss? I know I've been a little bit longer than I typically go. I appreciate you.